Good morning. Bowen in the morning here with you on Giant FM WROI. We're joined in studio by Dr. Uh, Eric Seward with Woodlawn Hospital. Dr. Seward, good morning. How are we? Oh, great. It's a fantastic day. It's been a fantastic weekend. I got out and did a little trick-or-treating um, with some kids, and uh, the weather was perfect yesterday afternoon, so it was really nice. Fantastic. And, uh, you know, uh, you mentioned that weather. It doesn't feel like late October, early November. Not quite yet. You, you know, I, it, it kind of comes and goes in ways, but the leaves are sure beautiful at the moment. <laughs> I, I did a little driving, too, this uh this weekend and you know just went through i had a semi-state meet up in new prairie which is just west of um, of south bend mm -hmm. and drove up there and then drove back here and then and then drove um over to ohio and between all those places it was nothing but reds and oranges and yellows just gorgeous yeah now it's, uh, clearly peak i've got a few more days maybe and then it's they're going to start to fall I think. yeah yeah fantastic you know I'd, I'd be fine if it stayed this way all throughout the winter i'm a white Christmas is fine. Snow on the ground, but that's the other 364. No thanks. I'm not into shoveling the driveway. Uh, what are we talking about today? Again, uh, Dr. Eric uh, Seward with Woodlawn Hospital. I understand uh, breastfeeding is the topic of discussion this it, morning. It is, and I, I'm kind of dovetailing this. Um, October is always Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and so I'll, I'll start out by giving a plug. Um, I think the last two Octobers in a row I, t I talked about breast cancer awareness, thought, Instead of beating the same old drum, um, I would start by giving everybody a reminder that regardless of what um, agency is recommending uh, mammogram screening, screening everybody um, is recommending that you get yearly mammograms after the age of 50. If uh, it's, it's always a good idea to get a baseline somewhere in the 35 to 40 range, ACOG recommends every couple years in the 40s. Um, if you have a first degree relative, meaning a mom, uh, a sister, a dad, um, or a daughter who have had breast cancer, or if you have a number of second-degree relatives, maternal aunts in particular, um, then you might want to consider doing earlier mammogram screening based on the age of onset. Usually we shoot for 10 years before. So uh, we've got some great technology. Um, old technology just seems to get better, and um, I know at Woodlawn, um, sometime in the last year-ish, uh, we added a, a 3D uh, mammogram uh, machine, and that's exciting stuff. It should cut down on some of the false positives and, and some of the smaller things. It should make them clear, again, at a time when we can do more to, to help prevent problems. So uh, that's my plug for breast cancer. Now I'm going to shift gears. I'm going to talk a little bit about breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. um, Breastfeeding is kind of interesting. I, I, I grew up in an era when um, everybody, our parents were all uh, raised on this, uh, the Dr. Spock method of, of basically child rearing. And, and there were all these um, notions that it, almost breastfeeding was bad. Mm -hmm. um, and I grew up bottle fed. And I always joke that I could have been so much more. Um, I grew up to be a lowly doctor, but the truth is I would have been a brain surgeon. <laughs> and, and here I am stuck on the other end. Um, but I, I think that that the, the one point I would make at the beginning of this and at the end of this is that what happens to a child between one and adulthood is probably more important than what happens to them between zero and one. But the difference is, as a parent, you have so much more control over that first year. And so these choices that are very personal to people um, are things that people feel very passionately about. And I would always say it's good to take a step back and look at things in perspective. Um, but we as as a uh, one thing that's very clear is that uh, breastfeeding has some very clear benefits um, it's not that bottle feeding is a failure by any stretch there are certainly people that either can't or don't choose to breastfeed for very good reasons and um, again your kid can grow up to be a doctor um, that's you know as i think that there's a lot of of things that factor into the the decisions um, to start breastfeeding and then how long to continue and so forth and so on mm -hmm. but i i thought i'd start um, first by just sort of discussing uh, general trends that we've seen and, this, and we've seen these things really over the last 30 years um, at, fairly consistently and one of those trends is that there's a socioeconomic gradient to breastfeeding. Uh, when you look at simply college-educated folks, breastfeeding rates are up in the 80, 85, 90% range. When you look at um, 
people that haven't graduated from high school, they're very low. You know, they're in the less than 10 or 15 percent range. And you, it's, it's kind of an interesting trend, but it goes right up the line. The more educated a person is, the more likely they are to breastfeed. Um, it also follows the socioeconomic poor to rich grade. The, the better off somebody is socioeconomically, the more likely they are to breastfeed. And, and one could say, well, right, you know, the education goes along with the mm-hmm. socioeconomics of that. But it's interesting to me because the cheapest way to feed a baby by far is breastfeeding. You yeah. know, no doubt about it. And I've bought formula before. I know how expensive it is. And, um, and so... Ultimately, you know, that's a trend that we see, and it, it clearly has something to do with um, sort of the way we view things in society and perhaps the ease of, of the communities that we live in. Um, it's, it's just sort of, you know, sort of a trend that we see. I think that when we look at, at our goals, I guess, um, as a society, we probably ought to be, you know, when, when we think about lifting up the folks that are less educated making them more educated well that's a fairly clear directive you try to you know improve school Mm -hmm. um you try to get more people to stay in school longer you try to get people more you know focused on on training that gets them uh you know higher up the the socioeconomic ladder um but when it comes to breastfeeding you know sort of the cart pulling the horse maybe um ultimately Probably we would like to get everybody to think about this, not so much from um, a rich, poor, um, educated, not educated perspective, but from a from the perspective of what's sort of best health-wise. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's there's a bunch of, of reasons why that's true. Um, we'll start with nutrition. Nutrition is is I mean, breast milk has evolved over millions of years to specifically feed a baby. <laughs> that's, that's the food of choice, mm-hmm. uh, no doubt about it. Mother Nature has worked on this for a long time. And um, ultimately, it is it is perfected down to the ratios of this and that, the right fats, the right proteins, the things that are best uh, suited for babies. Um, now, we've done remarkable jobs. This is one of the great things about living in the modern age. Um, there's a reason why cows are sacred in India. Um, cows are sacred in India because cow milk theoretically can can keep a baby alive. Mm-hmm. And there were times in history when that, that's exactly what happened. Now, we know that's not the best way to feed a baby, but it, it, it works. And mm-hmm. therefore, cows are in sacred significance. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it also probably uh, relates a little bit more locally to why the dairy industry is so important in the modern Western world. Because... Um, of that that very concept that milk is is sort of this this vital nutritious thing um so nutritious it could keep a baby alive mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> where not many things can you can't feed a baby most things mm-hmm. you know that's that's really the one thing in nature that you could feed a baby and hope to maybe have some success again cow's milk is not breast milk though mm-hmm. um we make the best kind of milk and it's really we might be able to get i don't know about this we might be able to get good milk from uh from primates uh, other primates but it's hard to milk an orangutan yeah and uh <laughs> it's hard to find them and it's hard to set up the dairy yeah. uh, for that yeah um but i think uh you know when you think about really what we're evolved to do that's that's really what what breasts are for mm-hmm. um contrary to to uh, popular culture and modern society and advertising breasts are to feed babies that's their first jo- job mm-hmm. so thing number one is nutrition thing number two and this is this requires a little bit of science um but when you are when when we are exposed to pathogens and by pathogens i mean bacteria viruses you you name it um you cut your finger dirt gets in the wound pathogens Mm -hmm. um our body sets up an immune response and one of the methods that it goes about uh responding to invaders is it creates um, antibodies 
and there's a couple of waves. It's kind of like the um, the military in that they send the Marines in first and then they send in the infantry. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, the Marine uh, Corps in our bodies are these things called IgM antibodies. IgM antibodies are sort of big clunky antibodies not this is not to i'm not picking on the marines here they're awesome uh, but these big clunky antibodies that really are are fast produced our bodies produce them quickly to go out and get whatever that invader is right now so there's mm-hmm. a sort of initial immunity wave that happens um, these antibodies are too big to cross the placenta they don't get into where the baby is. So if you are exposed to something during your pregnancy, that immunity probably isn't going to get to the baby immediately. But give it a little time, the factory starts producing something called IgG antibodies. And IgG antibodies are, are immunity that sort of starts up in the weeks to, to a few months after that initial exposure. And then we, we maintain this, this memory, what we call an amnesia memory or uh, an amnestic memory for whatever that exposure was. And a great example would be chicken pox. Mm-hmm. Um, some, some kid gets chicken pox. They mount this immunity. If you check a week later, you would see their IgM is high. Uh, that's a tool actually for us doctors because we can check that IgM and we can say, ah, you've recently been exposed to, in this case, chicken pox. And then the IgG factory goes into gear a month or two months later. You've got IgG levels as those IgM levels are fading away. They raise, and they're there. That factory now has the blueprint for fighting off chicken pox. And as long as something doesn't happen to the factory, uh, then ultimately we can can keep chicken pox at bay. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's sort of the theory there. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out those IgG antibodies are small enough that they do cross the placenta. So they're not quite as, as big and clunky. They're, they're sort of smart, long-lasting antibodies. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so they cross the placenta, they get in there, and the baby now has this passive immunity from mom for a, a lot of things. Whatever mom has in her system, whatever she's ever been exposed to, it's there. Mm-hmm. And so that stuff gets through. It creates this, this initial wave of immunity. Sure. Now a baby's born. It has these passive IgG antibodies floating around in its system, and ultimately they start to fade away because they they don't last forever. These little proteins last uh, for whatever amount of time they last. I don't know what the expiration date is, but they have a half-life. And so initially, if that baby were to get, say, exposed to chicken pox, it should have some immunity to it. Mm -hmm. Um, But a week or two later, um, it won't. And it takes about six weeks, maybe eight weeks for the baby's own immune system to kind of kick up into gear in order for it to fight off things. One of the... um, if you, if you read through parenting guides, sometimes you'll see this this notion that you shouldn't take your baby out in public for six weeks. It's kind of an old-fashioned notion now. But the idea is you don't want to expose this baby with a weak immune system to all the big, bad, dangerous bugs that are out there. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, that's a fair argument. But there's this hole, this gap from that first week or two after they're born where they've got this passive immunity from mom until they can make their own immunity and start to create their own fighting response to to invaders. That part is bridged really nicely by breastfeeding because, Mm -hmm. again, they're getting passive immunity through the breast milk. Um, One of the big parts, one of the big most important parts of that initial what we call colostrum, the first part of breast milk that comes out, um, it, it has a, a fun name called Witch's Brew, which is great for this time of year. But it's just this sort of thick, gummy, um, yellowy um, milk that comes out like right away before the actual milk gets flowing. Mm-hmm. That stuff is very rich in, in these antibodies, and all breast milk is rich in antibodies. Um, and so one, one of the important, important, important reasons to breastfeed is uh, to give that that first six weeks of immunity and bridge that gap. Sure. sure. Makes sense, right? Yeah. Um, kind of interesting things. We we know, and I think uh, sometimes you can connect the dots in other ways, but one of the very interesting things is that if you project out to kids when they start school, when they're five, six, seven, eight years old, not necessarily when they're 18, 19, or 20 years old, but when they first start school the first year or two, they tend to perform better in school. They have higher test scores. They tend to have higher achievements. Um, if they were breastfed. Mm -hmm. And um, last but not least, um, and this is important in this day and age, um, they tend to have leaner body mass. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So um, bottle feeding, and, and I, I'm not sure what the pathol or what the physiology of this is exactly, but um, I think it it comes from the fact that when you are a baby, a lot of physiologic adaptations are happening, and it's a little bit harder to breastfeed mm-hmm. than it is to bottle feed. You can you can, I mean, you know, all of us can go get a soda and crank it to the sky and see how fast we can drink it um that's you know we can drink those things down faster than our body probably needs them (laughs) and one could argue whether we need them at all yeah but the um the the to to suck it through a straw is just a little harder especially if that straw has some resistance Mm -hmm. um and so it's a a skill set that babies have to form at a particular time when they are physiologically adapting to being a human and so it makes sense to some degree that that affects how much, how many fat cells they have, how their metabolism works. And there may be something innate in breast milk itself that that does that too. Um, But it's definitely easier to feed through a bottle than it is through a breast. And it's an acquired skill. It's one of the reasons why our new moms, when they're first starting to breastfeed, we really encourage them to try to really just breastfeed until they get good and established because bottles are so much easier babies will develop bad habits Mm -hmm. but we do know that if you fast forward these kids do better in school they're leaner and ultimately that's that's a a a good thing all around we think for the development of kids um now it's not to say you know we like i said we live in the modern age and uh they're formulas have become a science Mm -hmm. and you can go to walmart or or any place that sells formulas um and you can look and you can see that there are four or five major brands of formulas and each one of them has different uh concoctions that deal with specific problems either digestive issues or sometimes it's lactose or whatever other things that might be affecting you know, a, a baby's growth or health, and, and we have babies that spit up on this formula, but not on that formula. And it's it's you know, there's this constant game of trying to choose, and it's it's neat that we have uh, that we are advanced enough that we can do that. And in fact, I've always um, I've always sort of promoted the notion that once you really get good and established, it's not a bad thing to throw a little formula into the mix okay. because you know I'm a dad, mm-hmm. and at at three in the morning or you know on those occasions when you're you're alone with the baby my breasts just don't work that way yeah. <laughs> and uh I, it's nice to have the um ability to pacify your baby to feed your baby to do what needs to be done sure um it, it some people are really big milk producers and they can uh they can stockpile enough um breast milk and that's always a better way to do it if you mm-hmm. can but it's not always possible and and that's a lot of people you know struggle just to make enough and it's also good to be able to supplement um you know if a baby's getting some or most of their nutrition through breast milk but maybe they're not growing enough or they're not you know they're not thriving according to the growth curves that we like to see throwing in a little formula doesn't hurt sure sure absolutely Last but not least, and this is this is I think a benefit of breast milk, and it's also probably a, a struggle later on. Um, I, I challenge you if you ever have the opportunity, taste breast milk versus formula. I can't taste formula because it stinks. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you've ever if you ever yeah. never but, tried. But, it. but breast milk tastes a little bit like the stuff at the bottom of the of the cereal bowl. It's not bad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so if you, um, it's just kind of a sweet milk. And mm-hmm. so if you ever want to. Um, you know, imagine what a baby's thinking. You know, I don't know what kind of palates they have, but but most babies, once they get hooked on the good stuff, yeah. they don't want the, the other stuff. Sure. You know, so there's kind of a, a, a critical window where babies will go back and forth. By about, I don't know, four to six months, mm-hmm. b- babies will selectively not let you switch them away from the good yeah. stuff if they haven't already been trained to. Yeah. So that's, that's sort of a, um, a, a, a sub point to all of that. I think... Um, Another question that frequently comes up um, is how long should you breastfeed? And this is a hotly debated topic. Um, some people, I, we as, as as physicians think any breastfeeding is better than no breastfeeding. So mm-hmm. if we can do a little, great. You know, if we can get people out to the six-week follow-up appointment, awesome. Usually that's semi-protected time for most people where they can just 
concentrate on being a new mom. Mm -hmm. Um, After that, life gets complicated. You know, work, school, all the other things that come back up uh, happen, and it's harder to balance. Um, If if a person can get out to six months or a year, that seems reasonable. Um, You know, back when when my older kids were younger, it was sort of when they sprouted teeth that the whole thing ended Mm -hmm. uh, for logical reasons. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, I think... um, I think that there are there are certainly some groups, uh, Lalesh League and others, that are big advocacy groups for breastfeeding, and they would recommend breastfeeding up until either kids self wean or sometimes till two or three years old. Mm-hmm. Um, if you look at indigenous peoples around the world, or if you were to look at um, uh, sort of the way that most indigenous peoples have traditionally lived, they they breastfeed as both a form of birth control and as a as a way to space out families and as a way of, of providing nutrition for, mm-hmm. for babies really up and sort of deeper into childhood. And so mm-hmm. there's there's sort of a big range. I, I'm not going to take a huge stand on that because I think you, you start to get into the politics of things. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we see, and on both ends of the spectrum, we see the, the politics of the sort of hardcore advocacy for breastfeeding, which is great. Mm-hmm. but sometimes extreme. Mm-hmm. Um, and you also, um, y- you'll get the, the opposite side of that where people are disgusted at the notion of somebody breastfeeding in the corner of a restaurant or something. And, and it, I think we've come a long way uh, it, we're much more enlightened in, in this day and age. And I think it's kind of an interesting phenomenon. And if I were to plunk myself down in Africa right now or Mexico or, or someplace that's maybe not as, as uh, developed, breastfeeding something you'd see every day on every corner. You know, mm-hmm. it just it happens. Sure. Um, but it's sort of a first world phenomenon that we've had to overcome, which kind of flies in the face of all that socioeconomic <laughs> stuff I said earlier. Yeah. But, but it, as a society, I think, um, and, and it really is coming from a lot of the advocacy groups. Um, and then the other questions that I get asked a lot is, uh, how do you get started? And uh, really how you get started is um, when you find out you're pregnant, you make the decision. Mm-hmm. Am I going to breastfeed? Um, that's that's the first important thing. Once you've made that decision to breastfeed, I think then um, there's not a, a ton you need to do to prepare yourself for it up sure. until the baby's born. Sure. Um, it, it's important for people to know that breast milk doesn't just start shooting out the minute that a baby comes out, that it there's a process. In mm-hmm. some cases, it starts before the baby comes out. Mm-hmm. And that's a common question I get is, should this be happening? And uh, other times... Um, it it may take a week or two for things to get fully flowing, mm-hmm. and so there's there's just a little bit of work and sometimes finesse that goes into making breastfeeding work well. Sure. Uh, we do have at at Woodlawn we have a dedicated nurse who's gone through training for lactation consultant. Uh, we have uh, I, I would say most hospitals I've worked at have somebody they they may not always be present, but somebody that comes and does rounds or at least one or two or, or a handful of the of the nurses on staff that have gone through the special training can guide our new moms through that process. There is definitely a process. It's sore uh, the first week or so afterwards and um, and it and it's something that, you know, if you're dedicated to it, usually you can make it work. But if it doesn't work, remember, I grew up to be a doctor on bottle milk. <laughs> and, and so there's no harm in, in, in failure, I think, when people feel like they, uh, this is a very sensitive topic for a lot of moms. Mm-hmm. And uh, we don't want anybody walking away feeling like a failure. Sure thing. Dr. Seward with Woodland Hospital joins us this morning on Giant FM. A couple questions for you, if I could, uh, in terms of breastfeeding. I, again, I've, I've never breastfed. It is the moon to me. Um, it, I've seen the breast pump. Okay, where you can you can store the milk. Um, is there like a shelf life on that? Is is it a lesser value if it doesn't come directly from the breast, pulling it from the fridge, um, anything like that? No. Okay. Um, and uh, I will. Uh, there's a that, that's a complicated and, and nuanced question, but um, <laughs> but first of all, no. If you if you can um, if you can get adequate breast milk out that you can freeze it, you can freeze it with sort of an unlimited shelf life. Okay. Um, 
it it just like any milk it'll go it'll have an expiration date and it sadly doesn't come out with at least the i've never seen the cartons with the expiration date on them from for breast milk but yeah um but you, you want to use it you know reasonably yeah. soon if you refrigerate it it probably would last a, a week or maybe two sure um but I, I think that that the nutritional value of it is going to be the same. Mm-hmm. You shouldn't be losing anything significant. Um, there There is a difference between feeding from the breast and feeding from the bottle. Mm-hmm. And that's sort of twofold. One, there's a... A bonding process of breastfeeding with moms, which is which is sort of a different um, one of the one of the things that gets pointed out a lot is that the focal length of a baby is almost the exact number of inches from a mom's face to the breast, oh, okay. and it's that's not on accident. Mother Nature figured that one out to mm-hmm. help with that bonding process. But that process of breastfeeding is is a little bit more tricky, difficult for a baby than the bottle. So. Mm-hmm. If a person comes into breastfeeding as, I don't really want to put my baby on my breast, I'm just going to stick it in the bottle and stick the bottle in the mouth, mm-hmm. um, that that probably undoes a little bit of that when we were talking about lean body mass and some of those things. It still gives you the sure. immunity and the nutrition, but but maybe not the bonding and, yeah. the, and the skill set yeah. that you might need. And then final question before we let you go, uh, for a, a new uh, new mother to be out there, uh, are there any dietary restrictions? Anything you know that they shouldn't be putting in their system because it spoils the milk, if it spoils the yeah. breast milk, if you will. Yeah. That, um, well, spoiling the milk, we wouldn't want somebody to go nuts with um, drugs or alcohol. That yeah. would be the first thing. Um, I, I the Doctor Spock method, and probably the way I was raised is if I was fussy, you have a beer, um, <laughs> and. I might explain a few things. I don't know, <laughs> but the yeah. the and that probably wouldn't do any harm. But I think you know, like more serious drinking drugs, things like that, could affect breast milk. There are certainly medicines and medical conditions that contraindicate breastfeeding. Things like HIV um, are are fairly controversial. Certain cancers, um, certain chemotherapy medicines that might pass. And there's a, a there's a big book um, that we we refer to about. <laughs> Um, breastfeeding medicines. So if a person's on a medicine and we're questioning it, we look it up, we we, we talk to the mom and, and discuss it. Most medicines are safe, um, mm-hmm. but there are some that if, if people are on them chronically um, or have to go back on them after pregnancy, mm-hmm. probably it's best not to. Okay. Um, and then food in general, um, you could find a long list of, of and it, it ranges from yeah, that's probably true to the wife's daily kind of things. Yeah. Um, I think every baby's different, every mom's different, but you know, we we hear stories all the time about how cabbage or broccoli or this or that um, affect um, a baby's stomach, and you know, that's something you just sort of have to feel through. Sure. Uh, there are probably like hot, hotter topic. Um, uh, things like that, and you can look those things up online. Sure. There's there's um, excellent websites that that discuss things that are more baby friendly and less baby friendly in the diet. Absolutely, want to get the hospital plug as well. Stop by and see you guys. Oh, where oh, you, yeah. where you located? We're, we're we're we should mention that. Always always happy to uh, to to see you. I'm in the um, office building up on the, uh, the attached to the hospital, and we've got great providers throughout the system. Sure. And, and we've got a great nursing staff that's willing to work with anybody that might want to breastfeed. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Seward joins us from Woodline, uh, from Woodlawn Hospital this morning on Giant FM WROI. Doctor, so thanks so much. Thank you.